Saturday. Um, my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I am so glad to be here with you guys today. It is not perfect outside, but it's a little nippy, so I'm just happy to be here in my grow room. And I just have a couple things I want to um, kind of out, lay out what we're going to do here today. So I called this seed starting check-in or check-up, actually, because, you know, I think one of the things that I struggled with for so many years was really figuring out when I'm supposed to start seeds, right? So for me, here in my mid-Atlantic last frost date of April 15th, I am literally kind of in a seed starting lull right now, meaning we have completed our cool season hardy annual, literally almost the planting of them. So those were started back in January and it is still a smidgen early for um, folks to start their warm season stuff. So I thought we, I would kind of just tell you what I follow and hopefully that'll help you. So when should, should you start warm season tender annuals? Warm season tender annuals are all of those plants that grow all summer long. I mean, we're talking in the flower world, zinnias, sunflowers, coxcomb, um, all those annuals that just produce their heads off all summer long because they love the heat, right? Um, and so in the, and in the veggie world, we're talking basil, tomatoes, squash, those types of things, eggplant, peppers. Um, so we don't plant those warm season tender annuals just out in our garden with no protection, just, you know, you walk out and plant them and let them go until the nighttime temperatures are at 60 degrees or above and holding. Y'all, it is so easy to fall for the daytime temperatures, but it's really the, the timing of planting outside is all about nighttime temperatures because that's where the damage and the kind of like setting your plants back come. It's those nighttime lows. So when it's 60 degrees or above, and holding for two weeks. You know, all of us have access to these weather apps on the computer that have a two-week forecast, and they're usually pretty true. So when you look at that two-week forecast and it's hit 60 and it's staying above 60 at night, forget daytime temperatures, y'all, then you can just go out and plant your warm season annuals without any protection or special measures. Now, when should you start those seeds? Well, it depends on which seed starting method you're following. Of course, we typically mostly soil block. Um, and as a general rule, I have two um, kind of groups of seed starting for or lengths of seed starting that we have um, in soil blocks. There are those plants that are pretty quick growers. And typically they only grow in the soil block before they go out to the garden for two to three weeks in the flower world we're talking about zinnias um, and even sunflowers. Both of them are really, really quick growers. So those would be started no more than three weeks before you're ready to plant them. But then we have some of those that take a little bit longer. And those are, in my for my book, just coming off the top of my head, I mean, we're talking all the celosias. You know, they're more like, I say, four to six weeks before your frost date. Um, I will just add also, I always tend to err on starting later than earlier because there is nothing worse than having beautiful transplants that you cannot take out to the garden because it's too cold or too wet um, and just watch your beautiful transplants grow into something ugly. So that's kind of my general rule is I tend to start a smidgen later instead of a smidgen early when you get pushed, right? So that second group are the four to six week um, growing transplants and those are celosia, basil, azuratum, um, all of those um, plants that take a little bit longer to grow. So you have to find your, um, you know, look at your last typical frost date, historic frost date. And in general, when you'll reach those 60 degree and above temperatures is two weeks after that date. So for me, April 15th is my, you know, historic last frost date. So for us here in my area, May 1st has always been like, okay, that's when you can kind of count on you're in the time now where you can just 
bring home your tomato plants or plant the tomato plants that you've started and put them in the ground. Um, and also your other warm season flowers. So that is the window for the warm season stuff. The cool season stuff, for most of us, we are long past that. Um, unless you are going down to the store and picking up some cool season annuals, I mean, whether it's broccoli and cauliflower and snapdragons and those types of plants, it is time that they should be in the ground. They should be planted in very early spring, six to eight weeks before that last spring frost. So for me, April 15th, right? Let's count back six to eight weeks. That means Valentine's Day to March 1st is when I should be planting cool season hardy annuals. And we're gonna take a little peek here in a minute um, at some of those that were the leftovers out on the carport that you're gonna have a look at. Um, and we may even walk out to the garden to have a look at some growing out there. So six to eight weeks before your last frost date, just get a calendar y'all, it's that simple and count backwards. And then when you find your um, planting date, which for me is mid-February to the 1st of March, then you have to follow that same kind of plan like we just did for the warm. Okay, most of my cool season stuff, I consider them four to six week growers. Count back four to six weeks from when you're supposed to be planting them. And that is the story, friends. Um, now, if you're just having trouble kind of wrapping your head around that, and I totally get it, um, I struggled with this for so long because I never grasped, oh, there's cool season and there's warm season. They're both just annuals, which means they only perform for a... Sorry, y'all, my water, water and can just fell in the bucket and about scared me to death. Um, we follow that same four to six week um, backup plan for both annuals. And so I just never understood that there were cool season and there was warm season. They both perform and live for about a year, but they have two very different planting times. And so that was really my goal with the book, Vegetables Love Flowers. Very misleading title, I totally own up to that. I actually didn't pick the title, the, edit, the publisher did. But the point of this book is it's a three season cutting garden book. And it's about how flowers benefit vegetables, all the benefits they bring to the vegetable garden. And then the simple steps you can follow to have a three season cutting garden. This is a big picture gardening book. It kind of, I walk you through why you wanna have a three season cutting garden and then how to do it and then how to, to care for it, how we prevent problems and um, how we just live with that garden, right? So um, I just wanted to put that out there that if you're struggling with putting all the pieces together, this book can help you. And then there's also a free um, video book study to go along with it. If you, you buy your book anywhere, it's available at any of the major booksellers. But if you buy it from us, which I'd love to sign one for you, um, we will send you also the, the, the link to the videos that go along with the book, but if you buy it somewhere else, we still want you to have that. So you can just go to the book page on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, and go to the book page, and it says claim your free book study, and you can get that there. I totally understand how beneficial it is for you to get a big picture view of a garden, a seasons, and how they all work together. I just never really, I always thought, oh my goodness, only summer was the really growing season, and what are all the steps I can take to make it earlier and later, right? And that's not really the way, the, the, the true way to garden seasonally. There are seasons. Um, some of us have better seasons than other. You know, people that live really, really north um, in the world, they don't have much winter gardening except standing at their window and pining away for it to the snow to melt. But many of us, like I am here in mid-Atlantic, even though it gets cold during the winter, there is plenty of tasks and things to be done. We live in the seasons. And there is winter, I was thinking about this this morning when I was thinking about what I was gonna talk about. And I thought, so what real seasons do I really enjoy now that I never really 
got before. And it's really based on seed starting is what kind of drove me to this. There are seeds to almost start all the time. And I know you can find it here on YouTube and you can also find it on my um, um, podcast, The Truth About Seed Starting, where I talk about the so many misconceptions that we have about that. But I never understood that in late winter, like January and February for me, that's a, the seed starting time for cool season annuals, right? Then there's very early spring, which I'm in right now, and we're planting them. And I'm on the verge of starting my warm season stuff. And I'm gonna show you what I'm using my heat mat more for right now while there's a lull in this freight chain of seed starting, right? And then spring comes. Then we're planting our first round of all those warm season tender annuals. And we tend to do that several times throughout the, win um, the summer. And then it's like, okay, as the end of summer is coming along, now we're like starting cool flowers for fall planting. Y'all there, and you're gonna learn about all of that in this book. Um, and so even in the back of the book, especially I, I put this in here, um, I know y'all can't see this very well, but there's diagrams in the back. And, sorry y'all, I can't even get my hands. Um, and if y'all can see it, it's like spring, I'm saying that right. I'm sorry, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And it gives you, it kind of shows you the evolution of how succession planting works and how you can like totally embrace, y'all, it's more gardening time. I mean, it's just so very, very fun. All right, so I want us, so since I'm not starting seeds this week, other than what I'm getting ready to show you, which is kind of, um, I have some experiments going on here. Um, we're gonna take a look at what is actually going on here on the farm, and then I will take you out on the carport, and we'll maybe even go out to the garden. So, so as I mentioned, I'm not really in deep seed starting time, which means our heat mats are open. And let me just show you what I've got going on on my heat mats right now. So something that um, you will see is on Thursdays on the live that I do over on Facebook, um, that is my typical weekly sunflower seed starting day. And we're doing some really interesting experiments this year. Well, actually, I'm sharing the experiments that I've done for the last two years. And I actually had a podcast that just went live this morning that tells you about it. And that's what this is. This is a tray of sunflowers that were just sown on Thursday. They have not started popping because I just moved them up to the heat mat um, yesterday. So they haven't really had the full benefit of the heat yet. And looky here, this is some that tree of salvia that we started together. We actually did, I think, this middle row and I've been doing, adding more and more. I went ahead and popped them up here onto the seedling heat mat because warming this soil up will definitely speed the rooting process. Normally I wouldn't be doing this because we don't have any space left, right? And you can see this is the this is the home gardener just getting started seed starter, um, Matt, and then this is the big one. And um, so that's what's kind of going on here on the heat mat, which is not really much, but let's have a little look over here at my grow lights. So everything except for that big bushy plant down there, which we're going to look at, um, this is all experiment, y'all. These are all cool flowers that I'm seeing what happens if I plant them later than the window of the recommended recommended cool flower concept? And who are these guys? So let's just take a little walk along lane here. First off, I just watered right before I came on. And you can see there is just a smidgen of water left in here. So let's just pour. I do have a um, drain in my floor. And you can just gently pour it off. So status. And so, you know, I always have my fungus net um, monitoring tool and capturing tool. Um, this is the yellow sticky traps. And you can see there's a couple of gnats on there. This is how you know whether you have them. And it also captures them. They're, tra they're attracted to the yellow. Um, and then, of course, every Wednesday, I put the gnat troll, which is a, lar a biocide larvicide, 
into my just watering can before I water, and every tray in this room gets watered with that. That kills any larva that is in the soil, which is where the adults lay them. That's the whole cycle. You have to have both pieces, y'all, to actually be able to prevent and stop the cycle of this. We start, we have these up year round in this room. And the minute I start watering trays in this room, every Wednesday, there is natural in there. This is, y'all, I can't resist pouring this out. I mean, I literally, minutes before, um, you just have to kind of pour slowly. Literally right before I came on. So that was status. This is Lombata Monarda. And if you have not grown that, you have got to grow it. It is not like the other Monardas. You can find all of these seeds on our website. This is Scabiosis. Which one is this? This is blue, cockadee. This is, you know, sorry, y'all, the tape's all different. But this is the um, annual baby's breath called Covent. And wait till you see this in the garden. This wintered over beautifully here for us. So we fall, and now we're going to see what spring planting. This is Sweet William. This is the heirloom carnation, which also wintered over beautifully here. And I was told this last weekend um, that someone in Zone 5B actually winter um, fall planted this and didn't cover it, and it looks awesome. So that's really exciting. This is more Godisha. This is some more stock, stock, I think that's stock. No, that's more carnations. This is more straw flowers, it looks like it is. This is Sweet William. Fever few Virgo, more scabiosis, more fever few, more stock, more um, Sweet William. And look, I always just want to show this. I'm constantly getting asked. Um, let's just put it up here. I am constantly being asked you mean you really grow plants in that little teeny soil block until it goes to the garden? And y'all, see these beautiful plants? This is, this is 60 straw flowers. 60 straw flowers, y'all. On this little, I think this tray is like 12 inches maybe by 6 inches. And look at this. Yes, they get, I mean, these should have been planted. All their brothers and sisters have been planted. Um, yes, they grow into each other, but literally I would pick up, I would take like a plant stick or like a popsicle and cut the big clusters apart. Let's see if this one, here we go, right here. I must have already done this somewhere. I would pick up this entire, trying to do this one-handed is not as easy. I'm not quite that smart, y'all. I would pick up this whole block of, soil blocks in my hand, and then literally just break the individual plants off. Look at the roots. Y'all, I mean, I don't have an explanation why this works so well, except for a combination of them not being trapped in containers, so the roots really get a lot of oxygen. Super great organic um, compost-based soil, and they're in such an amazing growing environment um, that they just grow like crazy. This is what would be planted in the garden. And I just wanted to show that. So this is 60 plants in this little teeny tray here. The length of my hand plus a few inches. Pretty dadgum awesome, if you ask me. So I need to put you back in the stand for just a second and let me put my jacket on because if I go outside without my coat, we won't last very long out there. All right, so... I'm gonna take you out on the patio and show you some more of the leftover soil blocks um, that Bobo and Christine have just finished planting. Um, we also got, we do not start Lysianthus from seed. I buy in plugs. And we were gonna plant those Thursday, but we didn't get to it. We had so much other um, planting to do. Plus we got the bed ready and I'm gonna show you that. So let me see if there's anything else I wanted to tell you on here. I told you about the book, and here's the other really special thing. Um, if you're new with us, 
We have this really, really special tree on our property. It is a saucer magnolia that was planted by Steve's grandparents decades ago, and she is on the verge of blowing, and you'll see what I mean in just a minute. You have, I mean, we just take so many images and videos of this tree as it goes through the progression. I think this is gonna be a good year. The two-week forecast has no below freezing at night, and that means she'll last a long time. Um, it'll be just amazing, so. All right, so we're gonna go outside. Just trying to think if I'm forgetting anything. So we're gonna walk out um, on the carport here. So this carport area is where I harden off stuff. So let me just turn this around. Boop. And Steve is out, oh, sorry. Sorry, friends. Steve is out here with our tractor. Um, we're getting ready to have a construction project and we're having to unbuild my shade garden. So here are some left, and here is the Tucker Man. Um, so these are leftovers from things that were planted out um, in the field on um, Thursday. And then these have another home to go to. I have another cutting garden project that we um, are working on. So this is st um, stock, straw flowers, billy balls, straw flowers, stock, 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 straw flowers. So all of these are really, and there is Mr. Z over there working. And so here are our gorgeous Lysianthus. So these are plugs. Um, friends, once you become a full-time flower farmer, um, there's just, you have to pick and choose your battles. This is not a battle I wanna do. I have started Lysianthus from seed. It takes forever. And there's a lot of ways that you can kill um, these plants during 12 weeks. Overwatering, underwatering, temperature, uh, lots of issues. So these came from Farmer Bailey Plugs. You can find him online. Um, he specializes in really amazing varieties as well as smaller quantities than big plant brokers, which we, we've typically bought from the larger plant brokers. I mean, normally this is only three trays. Each tray is, how many is in there? I'm trying to read it, y'all. 216. Normally, we get 285s, and normally there would be like 20-some trays. So we used to buy from different brokers, but you can check out Farmer Bailey. And so this is the leftover calendula. You know, as I've mentioned before, we don't start everything in soil blocks. Um, we start what makes sense in, and calendula does really, really well in plug trays. And then this is my experiment over there. Those are plug trays of those cool season annuals um, that really just don't like warmth. And so we've been doing an experiment. Um, that's Ami Magus Dill. You can hardly see it. Ami Magus Dill, Bells of Ireland, which did not work. That's Bupleurum, and that's Daucus. Um, and we're just giving that a whirl. You can see the little babies coming along. Um, so let's just take a little walk out and then I will see if I can figure out if y'all have any questions. Um, and we'll just take a little peek here. So what you're gonna see here is we have uncovered the fall planted stuff. What you see with the covers up is what were just planted. Um, because we've been down below 30 the last two nights, um, well, it's not just two nights. The last, I guess then the day they planted, it went down um, into the high 20s. There's just no reason to submit those plants to that. So we planted Godisha, um, Stock, Calendula, some Scabby, um, more straw flowers and Stock over there. Um, but I want to start off by looking at these sweet peas, friends. I'm just so surprised that the sweet peas survived this year. Look at this. And literally, I have just had this row cover kind of balled up against here. Look at all these sweet peas. These were planted last fall. And they will grow up on this trellis. And see, there's clover and even a little chickweed going on here, y'all. But look at these plants. I mean, we're just really, really pleased with them. Um, and so, here comes Tucker. Um, what I wanted to show you out here is first off, we have our new, this is the bed that was prepared on Thursday for Lysianthus. So this is an experiment. Um, you know, you see the black film. 
Um, we use Bio360, which is a biodegradable film that works and has the benefits of plastic. Um, and we are experimenting for other uses of that. So look at this crazy dog. He's having a ball day. Um, anyway, so our experiment here is that underneath this mulch is Bio360. We didn't make the bed with it, meaning tucking it in on the side. We just laid the Bio360 on the surface of the bed after we applied fertilizer and compost. And you put the Bio360 down, it works just like you see a lot of no-till people using like really thin roll-out cardboard. It blocks the light to weed seeds and it's really easy to plant through. That means that you can literally use a screwdriver to just punch your holes when you're planting to get down to the soil and plant and you literally have no weeds. Um, so we are trying that with the Bio 360 um, and just top the mulch is put on top of it to hold it in place. Um, and so this is where our Lizzie Anthus will actually be planted um, on Monday. And we will, depending on what that, we probably won't cover it just because of what the temperatures look like for the next couple of weeks. You can see that we, we have a enormous amount of wood chips that were brought to us from a tree that was um, taken down right up the street. Um, this is amazing oak mulch. So we're just kind of shoring up our garden. You can see where the girls have applied it to the edge of our beds that had the Bio 360 made. One of the first areas that starts to go are the edges of the bed because we step on the edges, we lean on the edges with our knees, um, so they kind of shored that up. And these have not been whole weeded yet. Let's take a look under here. Let's be really brave. I'll look under here. I haven't looked. So this is Godisha. Let's get this mess out of the way. That was planted on Thursday. Um, some of it was pinched. You can see a pinched one right there. That one was not pinched. Um, so we covered it because of those cold temps. So that's brand new. But everything else here, this is a bed of one, two, three, four, five different types of Rudbeckia. And you can see it has not been whole weeded. This is henbit, y'all. Henbit is like a cool flower. It, it germinates in the fall and then just takes off. This is our funnest time of the year. We love this whole weeding business. Um, it's just so satisfying. So this is Sahara. Um, no, I'm sorry. This is Cherokee Sunset. This is Goldilocks. And you can see the difference in the habit. Um, and I mean, y'all, you can never have enough Rudbeckia. Not only is it amazing for pollinators, particularly native bees, um, but they all have different textures and different looks. This is the Cherry Brandy. Um, and you can just see the different habits. I just want to get down here and weed y'all. This is the funnest job. This is the Sahara. Our goal is to see how um, tall we can get these stems, but also we're getting ready to start some of the Rudbeckias again because the problem with the Sahara, for instance, which is a dark colored Rudbeckia, I mean, who wants that in, in late spring, early summer? Not many people. So it's not really useful that way. But when we were trying to see if we plant it again in spring, not very early spring, but spring, to have it bloom later in the season, like the end of summer, fall, does it get tall enough? I'm going to kill a dog. Tucker, get out of there. All right, y'all, getting ready to see him be a really bad boy. Um, so here is what I wanted to show you. Um, here, buddy, come here. Let me try to corral my dog. Oh, he just dug a huge hole in the Lizzie Anthus bed. Stay, stay. Normally he's not loose when I'm live for this very, very reason. So this is the two that I really wanted to show you out here. This is the carnation. Of course, it hadn't been whole weeded. One thing y'all are gonna learn about me, I'll show you the good and the bad. This is a carnation plant. Look how amazing that is. So totally amazing. And I've had a couple die out, so we'll find out what, um, we had a really wet winter here, so we, really had some die out that we are blaming on that. 
Look at this. This is one baby's breath annual coven. You can find it over on our website. This is not the perennial baby. Y'all, I can hardly resist pulling weeds. Um, but look at that. That is one plant, fall planted. Super hardy. Super, super hardy. And there is the suspect. So, friends, let's see if we can't... Um, come on, Tug. Let's walk over here, and I will sit down. There's a line over here I can attach him to. He just, I know what he went for. He went for the fertilizer that's in the new Lysianthus bed. Sit. Good boy, stay. Y'all stand by for a minute. This is not a normal happening. So I'm going to take a look at, all right, he's basically lassoed. All right, friends, let's see if we have any questions. And I'm going to turn this back around so you can look at my garden instead of looking at me. Good morning, everyone. What if you live in zone 5B and your last frost date is May 15th? There's often snow six to eight weeks before the last frost date. Whoop. Oh, shoot. Sorry, y'all. It takes... There's often snow six to eight weeks before last frost date. Wait until the snow melts or do a month early for cool season. So, Kim, um, you I mean we literally, because our beds are all prepared, right, ahead of time in the fall, um, we have been known to sweep snow off the tops of our beds or to use silage tarps to pull back to get the snow off. Um, like on the warm, like an afternoon that's really sunny. Um, I mean, cool flowers can certainly be planted into snow, into prepared beds if it's not too deep. Um, but yeah, I mean, you would have to wait until you can actually get into the garden to work. Um, but snow load is a problem. Um, but the benefit for cool flowers and folks that have a late snow load is that you can plant cool flowers into prepared beds that you prepared last fall, right? The minute you can get to them to do it, where it would still be a long time before warm season tender annuals would be able to be um, planted there, right? Because you're having to wait till above 60 degrees and the soil was warm. So that's the big benefit for folks that are really um, in the cold regions. Cool flowers allows you to plant a whole lot earlier. John, any advice for self-watering systems? Um, so I guess, John, you may be asking about for soil blocks. Um, I have no experience with that. In my opinion, every morning watering thoroughly. Um, my room gets up to be really, really hot and I only have to water once a day. Um, you need to be putting your eyes on those soil blocks every morning. Um, I mean, literally, I water in the morning and then don't go back to that room until the next morning. Um, so I do not have any um, experience with those mat systems. All right, friends. So I want to just point out that that tree I was telling you about is right over there. If you can actually um, see that it's starting to get a glow of pink about it. Um, and I am going to start walking that way and wrap this up. Um, and so this is crimson clover, crimson clover. This is where the warm season and down there um, will be put. And so I just remind everybody that we have a live farm cam that's right above my head. This is kind of the view you see from the camera where you can kind of look and see, oh, are our covers up? Are they down? Has she taken them up? What exactly is um, going on here on the farm? So I am going to walk this way and give you a little bit closer look at the tree. And underneath that tarp we're walking towards is our big load of compost. Um, and we keep it covered for two reasons. One, to keep the rain from, um, you know, just washing it away and to keep the dog out of it. So I'm going to show you all what the dog just did. Everybody thinks Tucker is just, he is not perfect, y'all. But this is what happened. Look at what he just did. So now you have a front row seat to 
that was there's bio 360 with the mulch on top so i'll have to repair this and he was going for the fertilizer that was down in there dead gum dog when do you pot up your tomatoes i do not start um i start tomatoes during that four to six weeks before my temperatures are at 60 at night or above which is may 1st so six weeks before May 1st. There's the tree, y'all. You just won't even believe how beautiful it's gonna get. I'll stop here in a minute. I'm just trying to get a little closer. So we have an image of Stevie's grandparents sitting under that tree when it was like 10 feet tall. It's about 60 years old. It's cabled, it's taken care of by the arborist and it is just starting to open. I mean, it is pretty amazing i mean we have so much traffic drive by our home just is um kind of just to have a look at it all right friends i am going to end this now so figure out when are you supposed to start seeds for warm season and when are you supposed to start season seeds for cool season and get that on your calendar and that'll guide you the rest of the way then you just have to know um you know which your seeds are so somebody i see just asked when do i move to the large block we typically do not i mean if you just joined us you can look back and see that straw flowers that are you know five inches tall that are still in the three quarter inch block and looking amazingly beautiful and healthy we time our seed starting so we do not have to move them up that's the whole point um, of reducing tons of labor um, and grows a superior transplant all right friends until we meet again head over to the gardenersworkshop.com for lots of resources you'll find my book there um, and until we meet again friends ciao